All right. It's just after seven o'clock and we look like we have quite a few people joined us already. So thanks everybody who is here. Um, this is the September LAS meeting and I will be your speaker. My name is Jenny Jones Trubinsky. I formerly worked as a condor crew or a condor biologist at Pinnacles National Park on the condor recovery program. And um, Parker, well, currently I am development coordinator for Lahontan Audubon Society. And Parker is also here to help manage some of the technical aspect as well as monitor any questions that are coming in. Um, if you do have questions throughout the presentation, feel free to type them in the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, we will, Parker will be monitoring those and we'll ha should have time at the end of the presentation for questions. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and jump in and share with you all one of my favorite topics, <laughs> the California condor. Um, like I said, I worked for Pinnacles National Park as a condor biologist for about seven years. I started there as a volunteer in 2009 and um, stuck with it and became a crew leader and then moved on to other things. But I'm going to share with you um, some general information about condors, and then we're going to go into a little bit of history about why do we care about condors, what's been going on with condors in the past, a um, little bit of information about the current recovery program and what that looks like right now and moving into the future, um, where that will hopefully go. So. Um, First off, what is a condor? <laughs> um, these are New World vultures. They are the largest soaring land bird in North America. And there's a lot of caveats on that because um, depending on how you want to define largest, <laughs> um, turkeys can sometimes weigh more. Um, Albatross has a longer wingspan. Uh, so there's a lot of caveats to it, but it is a large bird. Um, and they, um, like I said, are vultures. So their feet are not uh, actually designed for grasping. They're more designed for walking on the ground because that is where they eat, they can't actually pick anything up and take it away. Um, that was a common misconception, especially in the past, um, that condors would come and steal your babies or <laughs> your livestock and take things away. Um, so this, this picture here is some um, different feet of birds. Um, we have condor on the top, golden eagle foot for comparison, uh, turkey vulture foot, and then a, either a crow or a raven. I'm not, I don't remember which one that last one is, but you can just see the size comparison. And you can see also on the right-hand side of the screen there, um, that's a, tr a condor foot on top and a golden eagle foot on the bottom. And just really comparing the structure of those feet, they're just, they're designed for something else entirely. They're not designed for that grasping that raptors have um, because they are scavengers. Most of the things that they eat are already dead. I say most because occasionally they have been known to um, take something that is on its way out generally, um, but they will eat a wide variety of things. They We've documented them eating things as large as a gray whale, which is that bottom left picture there on the coast in Big Sur. Um, they're commonly eating cattle, pig, deer, um, and we've documented them eating things as small as a squirrel. So 
really wide diversity of things that they're willing to eat. If it's dead, they're happy to take care of it for us because they are nature's recyclers like other creatures. Um, this is a size comparison, um, true scale of a turkey vulture versus a condor. So you can really get a sense of, um, I think people are pretty familiar with how big a turkey vulture is and you see those around pretty often. Um, turkey vultures have about a six foot wingspan. Condors have a nine and a half foot wingspan. Um, but where the condor really eclipses the turkey vulture is in the weight category. Turkey vultures weigh about three pounds where condors on average are about 20 pound bird. And that is a lot of bird to get up in the air. It may not seem like a huge amount, but that's very heavy for a bird. Um, another comparison, golden eagles weigh in the eight to 15 pound range. Um, so this is a really big bird. Um, the other thing that I like to share with this slide is the um, distinctive feather patterns. Uh, we often would get question of how to identify the condor or am I seeing a condor? Is that a turkey vulture? What am I seeing in the air? Um, vultures have the lighter feathers, but they're towards their tail and the condors have that bright white um, triangle and in the leading end edge of their wings. Um, and that is an adult condor. In juvenile condors, it's a, they do still have that white triangle, but it's kind of more modeled um, black and white feathers in there. So um, sometimes it's not as striking as in the adult. The other thing, uh, turkey vultures, kind of toddle in their flight. So they, they'll hold their wings in a V where condors hold them very flat. And the turkey vultures tend to get knocked around by the wind a little bit and condors are very stable flyers. Um, they're just gliders, look like airplanes. Um, again, that distinctive feather pattern on the bottom, um, a comparison of condor versus a golden eagle versus turkey vulture versus a raven um, and also the size of the wings. Uh, on the right hand here, there's also drawings of an adult condor head and a juvenile condor head. As I mentioned, the juveniles, the feather pattern is not as bright white. Um, their heads are also a different color. When, when they hatch, they kind of have a pinkish head, but as they reach fledgling age or as they're leaving the nest, their head is a black color. And as they reach sexual maturity, it becomes that um, distinctive pink color with the black. Those are little feathers actually across their, um, right between their eyes. Um, but there's also a lot of other colors and you'll see in some of the pictures that I share throughout this presentation that it's not just pink. There's, there's blues, there's yellows. They're really impressive when they're in their full um, breeding coloration. They're also a very social animal. Um, you will commonly see multiple condors. If you're seeing a condor, you're going to see it likely going to see a group of condors. They're social at feeding sites, they socially roost. Um, they do have a hierarchy. So um, this adult here with the pink head 340 uh, came into this feeding site and um, you can see a lot of the other birds there have black heads and the adults will come in and they get to feed first. They get the prime cuts of meat. Um, and it, it's really interesting to watch them interact socially. And one of the, one really notable thing about condors is that they are slow to reproduce and they're long lived birds, which <clears throat> uh, they have typically, and I will also say typically through a lot throughout this presentation because these birds have been studied so much and followed so much that we've been able to identify behaviors where um, we didn't expect them. Um, typically they'll only have one chick every other year. 
but we have documented sometimes if um, conditions are right, if they have enough resources, they'll have a chick every single year, but they will only raise one chick at a time in the wild, as far as we've documented. Um, and it takes them a minimum of six years to reach breeding age. So if an adult condor dies, it takes at least six years to replace that condor. And that that is part of the reason why this is an endangered species because um, they cannot repopulate quickly as a species that is breeding every year and having multiple chicks per brood. It's very slow for the condor. Uh, something else that's really important and sometimes gets forgotten is that condors are a sacred bird to a lot of indigenous cultures. Um, they were often what's known as the thunderbird, thinking that their large wings were what brings the thunder. Um, and I like to highlight this because it, it is important biologically for us to recover this species and ecologically, um, but it is also important social aspect is that it's an important bird to a lot of cultures. Um, getting into their history a little bit here, uh, their range used to be a substantial portion of the western U.S. Uh, as you can see here, they were in Nevada, there's definitely some areas that have condor in their name. Uh, I've seen on maps in at least Southern Nevada, they were definitely in Utah, Idaho, Washington, all the way up into British Columbia, down into Baja, California. They had a really wide range. And then um, this says condor habitat today, but this map was from the 60s. Um, they went from this huge swath of the West to this small little U-shape just in California. And important thing to note is what happened, why? Well, um, remember they're slow to reproduce. So I'm gonna go over some of the threats that have happened to them and they may not seem like that should take out a species, but because they are so slow to reproduce, it's hard for them to rebound from some of these threats. Um, so when the gold rush happened and we had a lot of new folks moving out west, uh, one of the things they did was they eliminated predators and what they saw as competition. Imagine you are a rancher back in the gold rush and you come out and you see your calf is being fed upon by a whole flock of condors. Remember I said that they are social birds so there would likely be a large group of them. Your assumption is probably going to be that those condors killed your calf and they're therefore threatening your livelihood. We're going to shoot the condor. Um, their feathers were also used. Their Feathers are hollow and people would cut them off and use them to store their gold dust. So they were highly valued for that. Um, and in general, as they were trying to get rid of predators, uh, putting out poison baited carcasses for the, either the wolves or the grizzlies or whoever else to feed on and with the goal of eliminating those species. Um, and condors suffered from that as well and um, many vulture species have succumbed to that. Scientists are not without blame as well. Scientists and folks who viewed themselves as conservationists. Uh, condor again is a large bird, so they were prized for private collections as well as for museum collections. Um, there was a lot of egg collecting that was going on. And like I said, it's a big bird, so big feathers. Um, women use them for fashion. Um, all that kind of stuff. So that took a hit on them. They have definitely suffered from loss of habitat. Uh, these birds are used to ranging far and wide in search of food. And as we have developed areas, we're eliminating areas that they can potentially 
find that food in wide open spaces that also are, again, big bird, um, hard for them to navigate um, in small little habitat patches. They're, they, they obviously can go there, but uh, they're not gonna find food the way that they need to find in a heavily populated area. This is actually a condor overlooking um, some part of Los Angeles in Southern California. Micro trash has also been documented as a problem for condors. Um, we believe that they pick up small pieces of trash like bottle caps, glass. These were all removed from a condor, um, surgically removed from a condor. We believe they pick them up because they look like bone fragments and that is typically what they would do to get calcium, especially for their chicks. Um, they don't know how to identify or differentiate between these small pieces of what looks like bone fragments to them um, and they'll bring them back to their chick and the chick can't process them and isn't able to regurgitate them either um, becomes impacted and that can be a problem for them. Power lines, it's a big bird, can hit power lines and can definitely span the power lines and connect them. Um, and one of the final threats is lead poisoning. Um, there's been a lot of campaigns throughout the years to remove lead from all sorts of things. We've taken it out of paint, we've taken it out of gasoline, we've taken it out of um, shot for hunting waterfowl, but there are still a number of sources of lead out there. And um, the reason we've removed it from all those things is because it has no biological purpose. Um, it is poisonous. Uh, to pretty much all living things. So it's not safe to have out there. And the way that condors are getting lead primarily is through shot. So this is an x-ray of a deer, I believe that was shot. Um, and it was with a rifle. Um, but what happens with lead um, bullets is that they fragment. Um, hits the animal and breaks into a, a bunch of pieces. And so all of these white pieces that you can see uh, in this x-ray that kind of just look like they're peppered throughout, those are little pieces of lead. Um, and a condor is gonna come in, scavenge on bits of the animal that have been left by a hunter and are getting lead poisoning that way. Um, this is actually a radiograph of a condor. Normally there's these smaller pieces you can see just above that big bright white piece, there's smaller pieces of lead like we saw in this previous radiograph. It's normally kind of more peppered throughout, but this one actually ingested a large portion of the ammunition that was still intact. Um, so, all of those threats came together. And back in the 80s, we were left with 22 California condors in the entire world, just 22. <laughs> um, and there was a lot of work to figure out that there was only 22 left. Um, they watched that population dwindle and made the difficult decision to bring all of those birds into captivity and start a captive breeding program. Um, there was a big debate on whether or not uh, they should just let the population die out or do something pretty extreme to try and save them. And bringing an entire population into captivity is pretty extreme. So they brought them into captivity. They did some captive rearing. Um, like I said, condors will only raise one chick at a time. So in order to boost the population as fast as possible, they would do double and triple clutching where they would allow a pair to lay an egg. They would take the egg away. They would incubate that egg in um, an incubator and hatch it and raise it with a puppet. Um, and they could do that potentially to take the first egg away, let them lay a new egg, 
take that second egg away, let them lay a third egg. Um, and they could either leave that third egg for them to actually raise. So that wouldn't be three chicks from one pair in a single year rather than just one chick per pair. Um, the condor recovery program is not doing this much anymore, um, if at all, because our numbers are at a place where they're more stable and doesn't feel like we need to do this puppet rearing, but there are rare occasions where that has to happen. And they do the puppet rearing so that the chicks will identify themselves as condors rather than being raised by a human. And then we had to do something with those captive raised chicks. So we started um, some release sites. The first release site was um, down in Southern California. That's where the last 22 birds were captured from. Um, Bitter Creek and Hopper Mountain refuges in Southern California are the Southern California release sites um, and slowly brought on several other release sites to help restore that um, historic range of the California condor. So currently there is the Southern California release sites at Bitter Creek and Hopper Mountain. Um, there is Central California, which is made up of Ventana Wildlife Society and Pinnacles National Park. It says monument on this slide, but it's actually a national park now. And that's where I used to work. Um, those two release sites work very closely together. The birds go back and forth between them, but um, they're managed by two different entities. There is a release site out at near the Grand Canyon at Vermilion Cliffs, managed by the Peregrine Fund, and then one in Baja, California that um, the San Diego Zoo works on. So the captive birds are brought to these release sites and they're actually held in an acclimation pen um, prior to release where they can kind of get their bearings. They, now that there are wild birds back out there, the wild birds come and visit the pen. You can see there's a couple birds outside the pen in this photo and several birds inside um, waiting for release. Um, and in that way, the birds can start developing their social structure. We'll also um, put an adult bird in there so it's not just a bunch of wild teenagers hanging out <laughs> in the pen together. And um, once they have acclimated, we'll, they are slowly released out into the wild and they're monitored very heavily when they're first released um, and they continue to monitor them. Um, beyond that, but the first couple days after they're released, this is the first time that they're really getting to fly at all. So um, we're making sure that they are roosting in appropriate locations, not just on a bush somewhere where a predator is going to get them, um, and just making sure that they're they're doing what they should be doing in the wild, and they pick up on it pretty quick. Instinct is strong. Um, but the way that we track them in the wild is that each bird is given a unique identifier, which is a wing tag. You can see um, that bird on the left, the number 89 is actually, um, each time a bird hatches, it's given a stud book number and those are sequential. So the first bird in the condor recovery program was bird number one. We're in the thousands now. Um, this bird is actually bird 589. Um, the black wing tag with the 89 means that it's 589. Um, and we have biologists, I, I speak in the present, but <laughs> uh, there are biologists who go out every day looking for visuals of these birds, as well as volunteers who help with this. And each bird is also given a VHF tracking tag. So um, on top of that number 10, you can see there's a little transmitter with an antenna that is a radio telemetry tag. And um, Richie with the antenna there is tracking condors. So the goal is to have some sort of contact with birds, um, ideally every day, but it 
plants as they expand their range. It is often every few days. Um, some birds are also outfitted with GPS transmitters that will automatically tell us their location without being tracked. Uh, the radio telemetry just gives us a general direction of where a bird is. And it also, if a bird hasn't moved in a, within a 12 hour period of time, if that tag hasn't moved at all, it goes into a mortality mode so we can track um, if a bird is potentially dead, sometimes transmitters malfunction or some of the transmitters are affixed to a tail feather. And so when they shed that tail feather, um, it will give off a mortality signal, but it's one way that we are able to track the birds. Um, and those transmitters have a limited lifespan. <laughs> and for a couple of other reasons, the recovery program needs to be able to trap these birds back up. So biologists conduct uh, semi-annual trapping efforts and we'll also do opportunistic trapping if there's a specific bird that um, needs to be trapped for whatever reason. And on, we often get the question, how do you trap a condor? Um, our flight pen where we acclimate those birds for release is also where we would trap the birds. Um, on the right-hand side of the screen there, there is a fenced-in structure. And on top of it, it is currently open, but that top drops down and biologists will sit behind a um, one-way glass and wait until the birds drop into that trap and close the door on top. And then there's another lever that they can open a door that allows them into the main flight pen. And then they can reset the trap without the birds ever seeing them. And um, there's various traps. They all kind of fit that same structure. We bait them with um, generally calves that come from organic dairies that when their calves die, they donate them for us to help with our trapping efforts. And when we do trap them, like I said, those wing tags have a limited lifespan or the, the visual tags will replace, they get a little bit beat up and the VHF radio telemetry tags or GPS tags, we replace those. Um, we do a general health check on the birds and that health check includes checking, taking a blood sample and checking for lead poisoning. We work with a number of researchers to help us understand what's going on with these birds. In the upper left there, you see um, Dr. Finkelstein um, examining a feather. She's done a lot of research and helped us pinpoint where the lead is coming from doing, using isotopic analysis, they can actually identify sources of lead poisoning. So there have been incidents where lead has come from something besides ammunition. I think they're 99, about 99% of the time it is from ammunition, but there are these other anomalies, which is always interesting and shows us kind of the science works. Um, but if we do find that these birds have high lead um, and our threshold for high lead is way beyond what any human would be treated for, um, high lead is considered in condors is 25 micrograms per deciliter. And I believe if a, they keep changing the regulations, um, but if a child has something like two micrograms per deciliter, it's considered concerning. So um, these birds are pretty much, there's always a background level of lead, but um, if they are at that threshold, we will do a radiograph. Um, that's what's going on in that upper left-hand corner. Um, radiographing the bird to see if there's actually fragments we can see in the in their digestive tract, like we saw in that earlier slide. 
Um, and if not, we they're potentially treated in-house at Pinnacles. We have the capability to do chelation therapy there, or they're taken to, they're transported to either the Los Angeles Zoo or uh, more recently, I guess it's almost, it's been online for quite a while now, um, but it was a more recent development for me when um, the Oakland Zoo came online and we were able to transport birds there instead, which was a lot closer and um, great when, you know, these birds are going through a poisoning event, you want to minimize stress. So being able to take them to a closer facility was really great benefit to us. And then the end goal is that we release these birds back out into the wild and um, let them do their thing again. <laughs> uh, something else that the condor crew it does is monitors nests. And part of that monitoring is to go into the nest. I mentioned that micro trash is a concern. Um, DDT has also been a concern as the birds are feeding on um, marine mammals. Um, there, there's still quite a heavy load of DDT in marine mammals and there have been eggshell thinning issues. So we would go into the nests, we would check for fertility of eggs. If the egg was not fertile, we would actually swap it out with an egg from a captive um, breeding location. And that way it was, we could have a wild fledged bird rather than have it raised in captivity and then released through that less natural process. Um, if it is a fertile egg, we would leave it in there and go back in and do some health checks on the chick, check for micro trash. Um, and eventually put a wing tag on it. This is a short little video, um, Condor 340. After we had done a nest entry, we checked the fertility of the egg. The egg was fertile. He stayed in the nest the entire time and watched. Um, wasn't very pleased with us. We moved as quickly as possible. Again, wanting to minimize stress. And as soon as we were out of there, settled back in to take care of his soon to be chick. Such a cool bird. <laughs> um, and something else that's relatively new is putting in actual cameras that live in the nest so we can observe uh, behaviors that we wouldn't otherwise be able to see. It looks like this <coughs> is not loading correctly. I apologize for that. Um, that's a bummer. But there are several condor nest cams now that uh, have allowed biologists to document behavior observe nests remotely, understand better how and why nests are failing. And um, those are just installed in there and it allows us to have a more hands-off approach, but still being able to monitor the nests. <clears throat> several of these, excuse me, several of these nest cams are actually available online for you to stream if you're interested. Um, I like having them on in the background sometimes so I can be connected with my birds again. Um, but one of the tragic things that we have to also do is document mortalities. I mentioned that um, those tags will give off a mortality signal. And the reason why that's important is if we don't know why these birds are dying, we can't address the threats that are um, currently harming the population. So we want to be sure and track those birds, figure out why they're dying. And the sooner that we can recover a carcass, the better we are able to likely identify a cause of death. Um, and the last thing is outreach. Uh, the condor crews do outreach both to the hunting community, to <clears throat> encourage hunting with non-lead as well as just general outreach and 
teaching people about condors and getting more folks excited. So thank you all for being here tonight and being interested in condors. So back to when we were in the 1980s, only had 22 condors in the entire world. And here we are today. Uh, statistics for the entire condor program are only calculated annually at this point in time. So the last best numbers that I have are from the end of 2020. But at that time, there were 504 condors in the entire world. Um, just over 300 of them were actually free flying in the wild. The others were either part of the captive breeding are part of the captive breeding population. So about 200 um, are part of the captive breeding population. In Central California, between um, Big Sur and Pinnacles where I worked, there's currently about, <clears throat> excuse me, 80, 80 birds in that flock. And in Southern California, there are 89 birds down there. And one of the exciting things about those two release, three release sites, um, is that those birds are starting to figure out that historic range. So in this map here, that pink U shape is where <clears throat> condors were last. That was their last range kind of in the 1960s. And this was a bird back in 2015. Um, within one month, went across the entire historic range. Um, and typically we would not see um, the Central California and the Southern California birds don't interact much. Occasionally we do see flights, um, but this bird went all the way, I don't know how familiar folks are with the Bay Area, but flew all the way up to Livermore almost, all the way down um, across the Tehachapi and up along the Southern Sierras and more and more frequently they're um, pushing that range up on the eastern side along the southern sierras so someday <laughs> we may see them back up in our area which would be really exciting but unfortunately there still are condor deaths still an endangered species and like i said one of the important things that the crews do is to track um, mortalities the most recent publication on mortalities is a little dated at this point in time, but um, I think it is still valuable to share this information because we're still seeing similar numbers to this. Um, Bruce Rideout uh, et al. in 2012 took all of the condor fatalities in throughout the program and analyzed what their cause of death was. Anthropogenic means that it was caused by humans in some way, natural, you can see as a small band. And then we don't know about the others. They could be anthropogenic, they could add to that natural, probably a mix of the two, um, but we only can analyze the ones that we know. And again, that's why we want to recover those mortalities when we can. And then they looked and said, okay, of those birds that we know, um, why they died, what were the leading causes of death? And you can see here for juveniles and adults and for condors overall, lead is the number one cause of mortality in condors. And that continues to be true. Um, power lines are an issue and trash is a huge issue for nestlings. So the Condor Project does work on um, micro trash cleanups pretty regularly, especially if there are sites where we know um, condors are known to frequent. Um, try to clean up those sites and remove that threat, as well as going into the nest and making sure that the chicks are not getting impacted with micro trash. <clears throat> as far as power lines, uh, the Condor program has worked pretty closely with power companies to either bury power lines in some key condor areas or put on flight diverters so the birds can see those lines better. Um, we also 
each, excuse me. Um, it's a lot of talking. Um, at each release site, there is a mock power pole placed into the pre-release pen. It has a small charge to it, so it is acts as um, aversion training, and they learn not to land on things that look like power poles. And this actually has been a really big improvement since those were installed um, in the pre-release pens. And then, like I said, we do a lot of outreach and trying to educate folks on not using lead if you are a hunter or um, depredating animals. And there's quite a few partners <laughs> who are involved and this is by no means a comprehensive list of everyone who's involved. Um, but in addition to the release sites, there are um, the captive breeding programs. There are several tribal partners who are exploring creating new release sites, one in Northern California with the Yurok tribe um, out of Humboldt in the Humboldt area and um, the Nez Perce in Idaho are also looking at potentially releasing in the future. Like I said, these birds are sacred to a number of indigenous people. So I think that those partnerships are really cool and exciting to highlight. Uh, what can you do to help condors? If you happen to be somewhere where condors, you're within the condor range and you see a condor and you're, especially if you're able to make out a wing tag, reporting your sighting is really, <clears throat> really great, helps. There's, there's only so many um, condor biologists out there, only so many actual volunteers who are working on the condor program and we can't be everywhere that the birds are so reporting sightings is a great thing. Um, I also like this photo um, because it shows kind of the open landscape that this, these birds are living in. Um, supporting open working landscapes is really an important thing for these birds as well. If you hunt or you know anyone who hunts, um, direct them to the non-lead partnership, North American non-lead partnership to learn about why they shouldn't be hunting with lead. Um, again, it's not good for anyone. So um, you saw those peppered out pieces of the shot in, in the deer x-ray. Um, it's not just condors who are potentially eating that. The hunters are also potentially eating that, but also just other wildlife in general. Um, we see lead poisoning in everything from bald eagles to um, mammalian scavengers, bears, um, all sorts of things. So just avoiding lead wherever we can. Um, great. And I wanna wrap it up with some hope for these birds. Um, this is Condor 330. He's kind of a legend in the Condor program because most birds were able to trap, if not every year, every other year or so. This bird goes five to 10 years between trapping. And he is just out there doing what a Condor is supposed to do. Um, his transmitters, uh, he actually was trapped again this year, which is exciting, but also sad because I like when he's out there just being wild and free. Uh, but his transmitters frequently die and we have no idea where this bird is and often, unfortunately, give him up for no one's seen him, no one's been able to track him. We might have to mark him as a mortality um, and then suddenly he reappears. And it's always really exciting when you see 3.30. We had, we had gone, I think about six months without seeing him at one point in time. And we were talking about whether or not we should list him as a potential mortality. And then um, a 
researcher from UC Berkeley had some camera traps on a water source on a ranch and had a bunch of condors that were using that water source. So sent us photos from, um, <clears throat> from his camera trap and 330 happened to be on there. And it was such an exciting day to just see those pictures. Um, and he's since started breeding and we don't necessarily know that he's breeding until he suddenly appears at um, somebody sees him <clears throat> at a release site or uh, just when they're out tracking and he's got an untagged chick with him, which is super exciting, just that there are like truly wild birds out there right now. Um, and with that, I would be happy to take any questions that we may have. Okay, uh, I've got some questions here. Uh, our first question is kind of morbid. Uh, do condors cannibalize their own dead uh, species or birds from their own dead species? It's a good question. Uh, as far as I know, that hasn't been documented. Um, and actually, <clears throat> they've used um, what are called condor effigies or um, uh, a stuffed condor to divert bad behavior. So um, they see that dead condor and it actually scares them away from um, the thing. So I don't believe that has been documented, um, but it's a good question. We get that a lot. Sure. Uh, another question is, uh, how do you tell uh, the difference between a fertile condor egg and an infertile condor egg? Mm, that's a great question. Um, so it's really high tech. <laughs> we actually, when we're in the nest there, we have a high powered flashlight and um, you can do what's called egg candling and that's using the flashlight to, you can see the, um, Inside the egg, you can either see the embryo and or the vasculature. So um, there's veins and stuff going through the egg and you can see that. You can sometimes actually even see the chick moving around in there. Um, that's easy to do when you're in a dark room. It's a little bit harder when you're out in a nest. So we take a trash bag, put that over your head, <laughs> go under it with a flashlight and an egg and you can actually see the egg in there. It's a good question, thank you. Uh, and within that, uh, um, do males exclusively care for the egg or chick, or is it both birds? That's a great question. They, both parents care for them, um, and that's also why they only have one chick every other year. It's pretty intensive for them to raise that one chick, um, so one parent will be with the chick at all time. We also have had trios raise chicks, so three birds, either two females or two males, um, and one female or one male, um, all three will alternate between being on that chick. And when it's the egg, there's always gonna be someone at the nest. And as that chick gets older, um, the parents will be away more and more. Wonderful. Uh, our, uh, we got two more questions and then I'll call it quits. Uh, um, the first one, do con any of the condors develop relationships with any of the researchers? Uh, we try not to. <laughs> um, I think that the researchers probably care for the birds more than the birds actually care for us. Um, like I said, when we trap them, we're um, behind one-way glass, so we try to avoid them seeing us. When we put out bait, we do it at nighttime so they don't see us doing that and don't associate people with food. We'll actually haze them if they get too close to people on the trail. Um, <clears throat> there's also been problems with them landing on houses sometimes and tearing up people's property, so we'll work to haze them there. Um, so, uh, Parker, I know we talked about this, you and I, earlier today of wanting wildlife to be wild. Um, and that that's an important part of the condor program that we're always trying to keep those birds wild and not, not that they, we want them to hate us, um, but we don't want it to be a fun experience when they're 
around people or too close to people. Okay, our last question is, uh, is Pinnacles the closest location to Reno and Northern Nevada to see California condors? I do some quick math in my head. Yes. Um, yeah, Pinnacles would probably be the closest place to see them. Um, with any sort of regularity, they have been more and more often down in Sequoia Kings Canyon. Um, but that's kind of a few and far between um, to actually see them there. If you were going to make a trip specifically <clears throat> to see condors, probably Pinnacles is your best bet. Um, it looks like there's actually a couple more questions in the Q&A section, Parker. Uh, yes, you got, you have enough time? Yeah. Okay, uh, um, for a review, um, uh, uh, that one is how long do condors live, uh, the typical lifespan? We don't know. And that's a great question. Thank you for asking that. Um, the oldest condor, that we know how old the bird is because they were, um, this bird was brought into captivity as a juvenile. So we know how old it is, is 55 now, I believe. Um, I'm not sure if he's still breeding or not, but last time I checked, he was. Um, and so the thought is generally that, um, probably 60 plus years is a good estimate of their lifespan in the wild naturally without things like lead poisoning taking them down but we don't really know it is a very long-lived bird we do know that or it's supposed to be a long-lived bird which is again why their their breeding style of one chick every other year works um if they're not having to deal with these other threats. Yes, speaking of other threats, our final question is, uh, how are condors handling uh, with the recent Dolan fire, as far as you know? Yeah, the Dolan fire was the single largest mortality event um, for condors, or since the recovery program began, um, I believe 10 condors perished in that fire. Um, it burned over one of the release sites. There weren't birds in the pen at the time, I don't believe, um, but it burned very fast. And it, a lot of, I think it initially started at night. So birds didn't have the ability to escape from it. Um, it's definitely slow for them to recover from that, especially a large um, mortality event like that. Uh, 2020 was <laughs> for all of us, I think a tough year, but it was definitely hard on the condors to central California. Um, in addition to those 10 birds that perished in the fire had, um, I think they had 38 mortalities since the beginning of 2020. Um, most of those were from lead, but they're, they're working on getting some more birds released. Um, and currently they have a number of nests going on. So hopefully those numbers can rebound soon. All righty. And uh, this last question is, uh, um, when cattle grazing allotments are reduced on federal lands, does the condor population go down? That is a very interesting question. Um, I can't um I'm not sure that I could give an exact answer on that. Um, because condors are such long-lived species, um, they are pretty adaptable. And I would be surprised if you saw, you, you generally don't see those kind of fluctuations from something like that. Um, where I was working in Central California, <clears throat> The majority of the lands that um, condors were foraging on were private lands, not public land grazing. 
So we did not deal with that, but that is a very interesting thought. Um, and unfortunately I don't have a very good answer for that, sorry. <laughs> All righty. Well, that was all of our questions. Well, once again, Jenny, thank you so much for uh, leading this membership presentation today. Uh, yeah. uh, myself and the other guests are uh, had a wonderful time uh, hearing about your uh, research in pinnacles with the California condors. Yep. Thanks, everybody, for joining. If uh, you have any other questions, I'm always happy to talk condors. Um, you can reach me at the general contact line um, for Mahatma Audubon. Thanks so much for joining. Take care.